Hey guys, it's Willie Geist, and you have just clicked on a piece of podcast history. That's right. This is the very first episode, first ever, of our podcast Sunday Sit Down, where we bring you the full length interview from our Sunday Sit Down interviews on my show Sunday Today on NBC. We take the full deal. On TV, we get to give you about seven or eight minutes of an hour-long conversation. On this podcast, you're going to get every last word of what we said sitting down with some of the biggest stars, the biggest CEOs, presidents of the United States on the planet. So, our first episode, and I can't even believe I'm saying this out loud, but it's the truth, comes from our two-year anniversary, which we've just celebrated. It is Bill Murray. Bill Murray, the great Bill Murray, the legendary actor, the elusive actor, the myth, the legend, the man who turns up at people's weddings and bachelor parties and slides into their wedding pictures and throws out random first pitches at ball games and throws old ladies into sand traps at golf tournaments. Bill Murray, Caddyshack, Ghostbusters, Groundhog Day. I could go on and on and on. So the way this worked is Bill doesn't have a publicist. So you call this number, he's got a pager, and if he wants to call you back, whoever you are, by the way, he will call you back. If he doesn't, he won't. His latest movie is with Wes Anderson, a guy he's worked with eight times. Wes Anderson has to page the guy. And if he wants to be in the movie, he'll call Wes back. He says he always does want to call Wes back. The latest one is called Isle of Dogs. It's one of those stop animation movies that Wes Anderson does so well, getting great reviews. And so Bill Murray, a couple of weeks ago, walked into the Today Show green room and said, Hey, I want to do that Willie Geist show. And they said, Oh, okay. Uh, we hadn't heard back from him. He's like, Nah, yeah, I think I want to do that show. So literally, Bill Murray summoned me to his hotel here in New York City. We got together. We sat down. The thrill of an interviewer's lifetime. And we began talking about that movie, Isle of Dogs. Let's talk about your movie. Okay. You've done eight, I think it is, with Wes Anderson? I don't know. Something like that. I've done a bunch. What was it about All this one? one? What was it about uh, this one, the movie? Yeah, what was it about it that attracted you to the, the to part? To him or this job? To this particular oh, this, movie. By this time, he just calls and says, uh, he just leaves, sends a message, says, will you be available the first week in February? <laughs> you know, that's all. It's like, I was telling him, it's like Mission Impossible, if you choose to accept. <laughs> right. So he said, would you be available the first week in January, February, whatever the heck it was. Is there any universe where you say, you know what, Wes, I, I can't do this one, or is it an automatic yes for him? It's an, uh, it's an automatic yes. I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I can't, you know, there's no, I mean, there's probably a universe. I mean, that's the whole thing about the universe. There's so many worlds, you know, there's probably one that's, crypt, you know, bizarro world, you know, like <laughs> Superman's place where everything's <laughs> upside down. But, um, no, it's just, he, he's made made making movies his life, you know, and uh, he, li- he and making movies is, is a joy, you know, it's fun to be with someone that's making movies, making movies his life. So when you enter that world, you know, that universe, it's like here, it's, you're just, you're at sort of warp speed, you all of a sudden everything just accelerates, it's like everything we're doing is about this job, and everything is focused and intentional about that job, and um, you know, you, it's, you know, it's kind of fun. I mean, we've done some really fun things. It makes it kind of like a dormitory kind of <laughs> living. Sometimes when we were in a house and a bunch of us were in one house, we, I'm <coughs> sorry, we had a, we did a, in the, in the Grand Budapest Hotel, we were in this town, which is escaping me, on the Polish-German border. And we literally just took over a hotel, an old small hotel, you know, small. And it was like the actor's retirement home. You know, people would sort of pad down in their, in their uh, you know, pajamas and their robes. You know, yeah, coffee, you know, and you'd have some coffee. And you know, the lobby was ours. So there was no sort of lobby. And the one side was where the, the coffee shop was, and the other side was where makeup, morning makeup. Was, morning, yeah, morning. You know, and it was like the retirement home, and it was so funny just coming down the stairs in slippers and stuff. People wearing slippers, you know. And uh, we had the bar across the street was open all the time, literally all the night. And it's freezing cold, like an insanely cold place. And uh, you'd just kind of wake up in the middle of the night and feel like, man, and you'd walk over. And someone would be away like, because everyone was jet lagged coming from California or New York or something. So there'd always be someone over there drinking like hot <laughs> wine at like 3 3 in the morning and be like, Bill, you know, like that. It's like completely normal that you'd be. 
going out to drink wine at 3.30 <laughs> in the morning. Is that a West place. thing? Does he foster that, or is that the kind of set you like to well, be Well, not in? the alcoholism part. No, We're but all the, responsible the for communal that, but, element of it? But yeah, the communal part of it. And uh, like in Newport, we had like, we lived in one of those old, mm. those old mansion, and we had like a bunch of people in the cutting rooms and the downstairs floor, and hard to cook, you know? Which is kind of a savage thing, you know. You think it's cool, like, oh, we got to cook. Yeah. You know, you're gonna eat some good food. No, it means that you can keep shooting until 8:30 at night. Say, oh, we're getting dinner tonight. We're getting you know, some special meal. Right, 11:30 at night, you're having dinner. <laughs> right. Oh, right, right. That's a way to keep you in there, right? Yeah. It was kind of cruel. It was kind of cruel. They're going to design prisons that way <laughs> someday. <laughs> the white collar prisons will be that way. How do All you right. how do you describe uh, not the set and the way you interact with the other actors, but cinematically, the Wes Anderson thing, whatever it is? What draws you to it? Well, you know, it starts with the word. It starts with the script, of course, and the design of it is, you know, that's he really has, you know, just dived into the world of making films and the, and the look of films and the history of it. So um, the first time I read it, it's, it's an old story, but like they're always bugging me to meet this guy, <coughs> meet this guy. Like, and you got to see this movie, he made Bottle Rocket. And I was like, yeah. mm. So it was back when there were VCRs and they were, people were sending me VCRs. I have the largest collection of videotape VCRs of Bottle Rocket in the world. <laughs> Because all these people kept sending me this. I've still never seen the movie. So, and finally, some of the guy sends someone sends me a script, and I was like, okay. And they said, "Well, do you want to meet him?" I said, "No." You, what time? What, you know, what time? What do I wear? You know, it's that like, was it. It was it. You look at the script, and you go, "Okay, this guy knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing." And I, it'd been a long time since I read a script like that where you went, "Oh boy." This guy knows exactly what he's doing. Everything was very clear. All the directions were right there. Not an extra word in the script. I don't think. I mean, I, I mean, I'm, you, I'm used to throwing in lots of extra yeah. stuff because there's usually things that are missing, sort of just little pieces, you know, that are missing, sort of. But it was. I mean, I said very little. I did very little in that movie except what was there. So, so he's good. So, but the design element, I don't. Um, you know, he's got, you know, this wonderful cameraman, Bob Yeoman, who's great. You know, he's just a lot of fun. He's also from Wilmette, Illinois. Really? Uh, yeah. He's from Wilmette, Illinois. And, um, Cradle of greatness. And we can talk basketball all night long with him, too. We were on on, uh, on the Life Aquatic. You know, I kind of went big time on it. And actually, you can imagine what it's like to get a, t a TV in Italian, right? And so to get the Cub game in Italian, <laughs> <laughs> we actually had to hire a satellite dish on a little wagon that followed us around Italy while we were Is shooting. that right? <coughs> and we were watching it in, what's that, Naples, you know, right over like in the harbor there when the, when the Bartman incident happened. And oh, he and I were in the room going, then we had to go back down and, you know, <laughs> Naples, is, it's such a crazy town. Have you ever been there? It's, yeah, yeah. Well, like, it's like, it makes, the most dangerous place you've ever been seemed absurd. It's almost a cartoon. Like, like people try to rob you. I, I mean, I would try to rob you. Like a guy, you, the guy was sitting right there would just try. He just look at you, go, you know, reach for your wallet. You know, this is crazy. I mean, like small kids try to like carjack my little motor scooter when I'm on it. I'm like, are you kidding? Are you really kidding me? I'm trying to get carjacked by a couple of kids chasing after me. I said, run, come on, run, catch it. Just funny criminal town and you go down there and the crime meant nothing you know there were people like, doing stuff robbing everything so um, animated movies I'm always interested in, in your everyone's take on these because some people say it is like acting in a way other people like Chris Rock says I show up in my sweatpants I read the thing somebody wrote for me and I get a check on the way out the door it's his favorite thing to do how do you view animated movies well not exactly well, you can show up in your sweatpants, that's for sure, you know, but um, they've, I've had only a couple of, I've had a few experiences and some of them have been just savage. I had a, um, I was in the Jungle Book, I got to sing, and the Jungle Book was, what's his name, John Favreau's funny, you know, he, it's like, I don't, I'm supposed to be a bear, you know, I don't know, what does a bear sound like, you know? 
we had this a little bit of a conversation. And he kind of he heard me like my first pass, and he went, "So you're sort of like a Northern <laughs> Illinois bear, <laughs> you know?" <laughs> I think he thought I was going to growl or something. I don't know. I didn't have it. And I was like, "I'm sorry, Johnny. That's what I got." So um, he, eventually, he came to like it, I think. But and I but I got to sing with uh, Kermit Ruffin and these like and Dr. John and these insane New Orleans guys. I got to actually sing with these guys, and that was really that was that made a career kind of thing. That was like, mm. okay, now that's cool. Okay, now now I've done something. <laughs> so that was really a lot of fun. I did the Garfield movies, which were right. Like just cra one crazier than the next. I, I did two of them, and they were they were that was a that's a long story of like you know it's madness. But um, is the story true about you signing up for that movie thinking it was a different director? Yeah, that's I thought true. It was, yeah, it's true. It's absolutely true. And I didn't really read the script. And I was like, you know, I, I kind of want. I'd love to do. I'd try one of these animated movies. It'd be kind of fun, <laughs> you know. And um, I'm looking at Joel Cohen, one of my favorites. I mean, the Cohen brothers. These guys make great movies. Well. I, you know, I never. I did, I, I was, it was. It was kind of blurry, and it was one of those times. And it wasn't that Joel Cohen. It was a different Joel Cohen. There's an H in the one you signed yeah, up for. Yeah, I signed yeah. up with the guy with the with the with the Ellis Island spelling or something. I don't know what, but I got that Cohen, and and um, it was it was it was a really troubled kind of a production. It was. It's a long story. I'll tell you. Anyway. Yeah. But so uh, they'd shot the movie before they did any of the oh. cat stuff. They shot the whole movie, which is kind of like a backwards way to do it. And, and um, I went to work, and my, they got my friend Bobby Greenhut to be like a sort of a producer guy just to like get me to work or something like that, <laughs> I think. And so I, I started working on it, and the script was, you know, I had, I mean, I began rewriting the script basically and going, well, how can you do this? And, Looking at the shots and everything's already shot, and there's like this little gray creature, and that's I. That's what I'm supposed to be. In. So I was trying to fix this thing, and and I mean I was I mean I broke an insane sweat. I worked an entire day, and got through with one reel. Just ten minutes a movie, ten wow. minutes a movie. That because you had to go like well you can't say you know I had to rewrite everything and change yeah. everything, and it was really hard. And I I looked at the second reel. And the, the, we got to the second reel, and they showed me the first thing. I was like, Jesus, <sighs> hold on. Yeah, you better show me the whole thing. So they showed me the whole movie. I sat there and watched the whole movie. And it was absolute, it was insane. I said, who cut this movie? That guy's, w w give me his name. We've got to find him, and we've got to kill him so he doesn't <laughs> do this ever again. And I didn't realize that one of these guys behind the glass was the editor of the movie. He quit the movie that night. He, Did he, he really? Yeah, he quit the movie. He didn't come back again. <laughs> so, and I mean, it was just a savage butcher job. But I said, I can fix this, but it's going to take a long time. I mean, because it was really a mess. And did you think, what have I got myself into here with the Garfield movie? Yeah, yeah. it was what have I got myself into. And so the next day, the, like, so there was a set of golf clubs there for me. You know, like, because right. they knew it was a mess. Someone right. knew it was a mess. Right. So it took a long time. It took like three different sessions of going, okay, did all of it, and then say, okay, and, and then doing it again. It took months. I mean, I was in Italy doing some of it. I was in, you know. Wow. I said, okay, well, they would go and, because they kept, they're always creating and animating yeah. all the time. So I said, okay, let's do it again. And you go, oh, God, I can, you know. Anyway, that was a mess. Who knew that much had to go into the Garfield movie? That movie never was a mess. Thought. And then I said, just do me a favor and don't do that again. Don't shoot the movie first before you do that. Right. And they did it again. They did the very same thing again. And that one was really... And the first one really made a lot of money. It made yeah. a whole lot of money. Yeah. Uh, so how was... But that was... I don't know. I'm going off. I no. Just, I just love to go crazy on those guys. And then they did it again, and it was really bad. And then that one, how insane they were... <clears throat> No, you're never going to use any of this stuff. So, web but, extra. Yeah. So, um, the next one, I, I was working with another guy who'd never directed a movie before. It was like they, they, I don't know where they find these people, but he was directing it, <laughs> and they'd made it. Someone had made a had, had made a movie that had lots of talking animals in it, and so that was the Vogue. And so, unbeknownst to me, the head of studio of Fox and gave me Tom something, monster. 
Um, so I'm working with this editor, and it's, it's another one where, oh my God, the, the director said, this is just, who did this? Who did this? And I was working in the editing room, not just in the, not just doing the voices, right. and cutting the movie, trying to fix this movie. And I would work like long, long hours, and sometime around 3.30 in the afternoon, the director would say, I, I gotta go now. I gotta go, I gotta go take a meeting. I gotta, I'm like, okay, whatever. And he would go, he was going to this guy, Tom, who was cutting the movie a completely different way. At the same time, I was working all day long making this thing, trying to, uh, they were, that was, uh, that was the end of that one. So they killed the franchise with that one, because that movie was really bad, <laughs> really bad. Not that you've thought about it much, but it feels like you've, you've been thinking about this one. What, about Garfield? Yeah. No, it's just a funny <laughs> thing. And I, have, I did have a funny, I had a, in Zombieland, they said, any regrets? I said, eh, Garfield. <laughs> so so it's, people always call me on that one, they go, Garfield. All right, you guys don't want to hear this much. Sh sh anyway. They want to hear everything. Garfield but then, fans, but some so. of them good, and then then, but then I made the two with the, with Wes, which were great. Yeah. So then, as bad as those were, the one with Wes, the previous one, the Fantastic Mr. Fox, yep. first we did the first take on our friend's farm, and we we were like in the barn doing this. We were in culverts inside of tanks down by the waterfall, just all these natural places doing the recording of the thing. Then the next one, he calls us as well. I'm over in. Uh, in London, you got to come over here for f five days and work. So you go over there. It turns out it's about an hour's work, <laughs> and the rest of the time you're just clowning around. Then about a couple months later, it's like, oh, you got to come over to Paris. I'm in Paris. Same thing, about an hour's work, and then we're in Paris for like another. That's not a bad deal. It's good. He's got it figured out. But this one was bad. We only had one session, two sessions here in New York, and that was all we did. I thought, well. It's a Japanese movie. Why aren't we in, you know, Hokkaido or someplace right, to, for right. a reshoot? Where's the Nothing. trip? Yeah, where's where's my boarding pass? <laughs> so that didn't happen on this one. So you famously have the one eight hundred number that people call if they want to get in touch with you. Yeah, we know you always answer if it's Wes. What does it take to get you? To call back somebody who leaves a message on that. What are you looking for to move? Well, on? you know, you want manners. You really do want <laughs> you guys got to be manners involved, you know, and, and just the way people talk is different, you know. You can tell right away when, uh, uh, no. It's like mail, you know, you can look at it. It used to be like there was mail and then there was mail. Right. And now they spent a lot of time disguising mail to make it look like it's mail when it's really just a solicitation, you know. And, you, and you can get fooled every once in a while. It's like, it got me. Yeah. It looked like it was a wedding invitation, <laughs> and it was an opportunity to get a discount on pillows. Is there any consideration of getting a phone, getting a phone number where people can reach you? Well, you have to get a. If you have children, you end up having to be able to uh, send messages to your children. Right. They will not answer a phone call, That's but right. they will respond to messages. So you got to be able to figure out how to send them a message. So you do have a phone. Yeah. But for kids only. Well, uh, people get on it, and well, kids and friends really. They, they don't, I mean, you're my favorite. You know, it's just you just. It's, isn't it fun to say, "Who gave you this number?" <laughs> I just love to say, "Who gave you this number?" Who gave you this number? I can't tell you that. Okay, I'll let you go. <laughs> <laughs> which is a great California That's expression, amazing. which I love. Okay, I'm mean, you're on the phone with people, and they really want to hang up on you. All right, I'll let you go. <laughs> it's, uh, California is good for something. And that alone is, it's like Woody Allen said, the, 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 the only thing that California did was right turn on a red That's light. That's right. That's right. It was the greatest thing they ever did until this, I'll let you go, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Has this always been your way of doing business, the phone number? Like when you were coming up in the business, were you more no, accessible? No, I used to have an agent. I had, I had yeah. Ovitz. I had Mike Ovitz. He was the greatest agent of all time. Yeah. He was spectacular. He, I mean, I mean <clears throat> my children's children will go to college on, thanks to him, you know. But um, when did you decide you didn't need fun. it anymore? Well, he quit the business, of, and uh, then, then it got a little disheveled. Uh, it got a little disorganized, and <laughs> I remember, remember they said, "Okay, I have a job. I was going to start a movie." And they said, "Yeah, it starts." Uh, Next week, I'm mean, like, great, you know, in Calgary. I'm mean, like, Calgary? Calgary? 
we're, we were making this movie in Southern California, I thought, you know, Calgary. Calgary's a long ways away. Yeah. I love Calgary. Nice place, pretty. And the Stampede, Stampede is awesome. You ever go to the Stampede? Been to the Stampede. That's cool. Yeah. One of the few things that's under underrated. My it's people, really my family's from up there. We've done the Stampede. Man, yeah, that's yeah. really good. But commuting with with kids when you got to go back and forth to Calgary is really bad. It was really hard. So that's the kind of thing that happened two, two times. And the second time it was like, and then uh, a movie that was going to be made in New York, oh, they said, and the same thing, like, f we're starting in four days in Toronto. I'm like, what? You're, tell you're telling me I'm going to have to go through customs 75 times <laughs> or 76 times? I got to go through customs 76 <laughs> times to go to, to go to work on this job? I said, I'm not done. So that's when it oh, happened. Four days before you said. It was like yeah. that. It was like, yeah. what? They, they, they got a little disorganized. So at that point, you realized, that was let me run this myself? Yeah. And yeah. <coughs> they also have, <coughs> pardon me, I don't know where I'm going, but it's all the pollen coming down with the snow. <laughs> <coughs> and they have people in those, that business where it'll be like, get me Willie Geist. And so someone calls Willie Geist, right. and the phone, and they have no other uh, thing to do until Willie Geist picks up the phone. So the phone will ring 150 times. Right. I'm not exaggerating. I mean, just ring for minutes. And you're going to go, well, they're going to hang up sometime. And finally, you just pick it up and say, who is this? Hi, are you, are you, is, is he in for Dennis? You know, whatever the hell they say. I say, no, and not going to be. You know, it's infuriating. This is my house, you know. And you say, I'll let you go. <clears throat> I'll let you go. You know, that was before <laughs> I'll let you go. I had other words then. I had other words that I'd learned. It was not good. Is, so is <clears throat> that, a, you've been um, <clears throat> known as a pretty private guy, right? You like to have your life not be I part don't. of the public thing. Is that a concerted thing that? you like to keep? Well, I mean, you know, your life is, nowadays, your life is sort of documented by every person with a cell phone camera, you know, everywhere you go, you know, and people want to take a picture, you know, or something, or they're videotaping you without you knowing it, you know, yeah. while you're eating your food. Look at <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, anything you can do to, to push back, you know, the, the walls a little bit. You know, I was always curious about people that, you know, be, have, they have a sort of a celebrity life. They either become total maniacs or they end up <laughs> in Montana with right. barbed wire, you know, <laughs> thousands of yards of barbed wire between themselves and the, and the outside world. So try to, I try to split the difference with that. I mean, it's, that's too much work. But um, I don't know. It's you can't be afraid of it. You know, you can't really be afraid of it, and yet, and yet, and yet you can't just jump into it, dive into it. You've got to. You have to keep some sort of balance, or you're going. You'll go nuts. Are you aware, Bill, of the mythology that surrounds you? That there are websites about your exploits showing yeah. up at bachelor parties. There's a documentary coming out trying to verify know, all the stories about you. Yeah, and they want me to be in it. I'm like. I don't, what? A documentary about myself? I think I'll wait till after I'm dead. Yeah. But, but do you realize that there's a Bill Murray thing? That <clears> he, <throat> might, he might turn up at your wedding and do a picture. Right, and him. I get a lot of wedding invitations. But yeah, it's, you know, I'm, I don't know what to make of it. It's, I'm not, there's no plan there. I don't have, it wasn't my plan. You know, it's kind of, kind of, it feels kind of nice, you know. You know, people like, like you, whatever, but. Um, you know, I'm just, there's no plan, you know, there's not a plan and I can't, because this exists, this kind of thing exists now, I can't like, okay, well, I've got, gee, I've got to work on my mythology stuff this afternoon, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't, like, oh, Jesus, what am I doing about my myth, huh? What am I doing about the myth today? It's not like that, you know, it's just. Um, but what's the but what goes through your mind? Let's say there's a couple taking wedding pictures in Charleston, South Carolina. Mm. You see him over there. You could keep walking; nobody would notice you. When you drop in on those photos, what are you thinking? Well, that kind of a thing is like you just look and you go, "Oh my God, there's two people that are in love." 
really mm -hmm. in love. You know, and, so, and there's a difference. There's people that are getting married and there's people that are in love. Those people were in love. And it's, it's extraordinary just to get in the space of them, you know, in the, into the thing of it. And I wasn't thinking, I was, oh, let me just jump into your, let me, let me photobomb your, your wedding, your, your, your engagement <laughs> pictures. I was like, God, look at you, look at you. They were just a lit, they were lit. And I knew the people in the house, who in the house too, and they, <laughs> they told me, they're like, oh God, there's people taking their picture on our porch, on our steps again, and who was it? Oh, it's Bill. <laughs> You know, <laughs> <laughs> they were going to kick him off the porch, I think. Um, but that's got to feel good to be the guy who, it, when it, he shows up, it's kind of fun. It's exciting it, fun. and happy. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun to just drop in, and you know that I, always, I, I read this thing once that, like in Tibet, like when someone's in love, they make them wear a bell, hmm. so that people don't, because people can will fall in love with people that are in love, and it, it's dangerous. You know, kind of dangerous. So. They make them wear a belt so they don't, okay, DEFCON 4 <laughs> with this person. You know. But it's fun to drop in um, like that and at the same, you know, but you don't want it to, like, to change the event. You know, you don't want it to change it and like, oh, you don't want it to be about you. It's just, it's just sort of fun to jump on those things every once in a while. And but that is their story forever. Yeah. If you show up at a bachelor party, Bill Murray yeah, was there. That sort of stuff happens. but. <laughs> You know, and it's not, it's just sort of being free enough to say, this is, this looks, this looks funny. You know, bachelor parties are funny, you know, and sometimes the bachelor party assaults you kind of thing, but they're, they're funny because there's someone who's going, you know, it's not exactly the, you know, the, the guillotine, you know, but, the, but one of us is going to get his head cut off tomorrow, you know, and one of us is going to be, <laughs> one of us is going to, is on the block, you know, and that's, and it's going to be different tomorrow. His life's going to change completely tomorrow. You know, it's like you, they have a child, your life changes completely right. and forever. Yep. You know? There is this perception that you kind of float through life, that you answer that phone when you want to, you take the jobs you want to, you drop in, you make people happy at random events. Is that, you're not self-conscious, you know who you are. Is that an accurate description of you? Well, I'm not conscious. As far as, far as <laughs> fair enough, that's probably it. Probably, that's a fair one. I'm not conscious. Um, I just like some celebrities, as well known as you are, live in a world where they're in a bubble and they don't go out into the world. That's yeah. You know, it's and it's true. And it's and it's. I don't know if they're saving themselves for their work or they're saving themselves for themselves. You know, which maybe that's all right too. You know, that's. Um, I just, for me, I need to collide with things. You know, I, I need to collide with things. And, um, and, and the, you know, I don't know how to explain it, but uh, uh, like the smartest guy I knew said, okay, that m the moment when, you know, you are recognized, when in that moment of, hey, that's you, that's where your work will be. That's where your real work will be, and mm -hmm. like what happens then. And a lot of things happen in that moment, where cause sometimes you're just daydreaming, you know, and you're gone, you're a million miles away, and someone, and even though it's they, you're just awakened. It's like a shock. <clears throat> someone calls you on yourself, you know, it calls you on yourself, you know, and you got to come back. You have to return to oh, here I am again. Mm. So that's. And a lot of things, a lot of different kind of things can happen in the moment too, where you can react automatically and you see yourself react automatically. You can do the kinds of things that get you into it, out of it, make it worse, exacerbate it. Sometimes it's irritating. It can be like three o'clock in the morning and you know, and you really don't want to, inter you know, really want to engage right. with anyone. You know, it can be, you can be having a really hard day. You can be, something can, terrible hard can be happening in your life and all of a sudden you got this thing. Mm -hmm. you know? So the floating part of it is there is a kind of a, okay, what am I going to do here <clears throat> and not be self-conscious and be, and just sort of be, uh, what, would a, what would an ordinary, what would you do in this situation that would be a natural thing to do? What would be natural behavior in the situation? You know, and not, it's not a plan, but you know, you try to be as natural as you can. You try to really relax. You know, you try to sort of bring yourself back into your skin, and 
and see if you can negotiate, you know, see the past go inner life and and you know make it make a moment just elevate a little bit, just elevate something. So you play you were back at SNL a few weeks ago playing Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon. Doing hey. a spoof of my show, by the way, Morning Joe. Um, you did you like it? Morning, it was did you excellent. Guys okay? was the okay? Willie guys was just okay. But we can get into that later. <laughs> but what does it feel like for you to be back in that building, back on that show, 40 years after you first walked in there? Well, um, you f like you say, uh, you feel comfortable. <clears throat> you know what you're doing. I mean, I used to know everyone's name and face, and now there's a whole, you know, there's obviously all the crew is gone. There's only one person left from the original crew, and he wasn't there. He'd gone home early that day. Phil Hines, who's I think he's ninety something. Oh right, and he's the, right. he's a pistol. <laughs> he light, is he lighting? Belly. Phil? Yeah, he's a yeah. lighting guy. Yeah, and he's good. He's great, and he's still the guy. And um, <clears throat> you know, he's had a little scotch in his little little, cl little closet there. Mm -hmm. He could be counted on. But um, <laughs> yeah, to go in there and you know, everyone's very nice. They're like, oh, well, thank you for coming, and the, you know, whatever. But it was fun. It was fun to work on that particular thing, and I got to spend some time because it was written that day, and we just kept working on it, working on it, working on it. It was fun to keep going, and I think everyone appreciated because everyone else had something else to do. They had like five sketches to do or right. something, so I had nothing to do but this. So I was like, okay, let's just keep going. We just kept playing with it all day long, and it got pretty good by the time we were done, and it was fun to do. I met some girl that worked for Steve Bannon the next day. I work for him. <laughs> I thought she was going to come apart. You know, I, I don't know what that meant. I, I didn't know if she wanted me to rescue her or call the police <laughs> or what. Was she upset at you or I don't know. She, no, she think it. I don't know if it's just the coincidence of seeing the guy who plays her boss right. the next day or something. Right. There is something about the next day where it's sort of larger than life. That was the. But it was fun in there. There and. You know, the crazy thing is Lauren's actually learned how to do the job. That's what I had to admit to him last time. I was like, hey, you know, you figured this thing out finally. Good. It took you 42 seasons. And it's a, boy, there, and there's even more people in that meeting than ever before in the meeting between dress and air. Mm. And they're surgical. It's really surgical. It's really like a war machine. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive. A lot different than when you were there? When we were there, it was still pretty much the writers and the actors, and the writers would still be bitching about something, you know, like, God, you know, we, I tried. Did you cut anything out of that? <laughs> yeah, I did. I did the best I could, you know. And people would still be arguing for, about this. There's no arguing anymore. There's no <laughs> argument whatsoever. Did our mutual friend Jim Downey help with Bannon? Or no, he no. did not. Oh. He did not. He did not help with Bannon. Um, but he's been. Uh, he obviously loves you, and has been at, at your side for. Many many years. Well, we have some great fun together. We have he he just he's really funny. He's so much fun. Yeah, we went to you know we've gone to basketball games. We went to St. Louis and so yeah, um, sure. He um, he's really a lot of fun. He's just the funniest guy. He's so funny. It's just a delight to meet him, and it's just whenever I can drag him to wherever I am, and <laughs> it's really fun. And the way he. Uh, I gotta get my taxes done. He's always getting his taxes done. Like, I think he's getting his taxes done from the '80s. You know, I gotta get my taxes. He's funny. He's, he's really. He's funny. not unlike you. If you want to talk <coughs> to him, you've got to sort of email somebody else. Maybe yeah. you don't, but people like. Yeah. I have to. No, I go through and, the channels. And he, he'll, yeah, I had to. My car broke down. He, he's, he's just funny. It's always something. He's just so funny. So when you think back on your SNL run of a couple of years, mm -hmm. how huge was that for you? How big was it to catapult you well, into the movie career? It was, it was enormous. It was an enormous thing, you know, because, you know, all of a sudden you had some viability as a, as a movie actor. You, know, when you went from being unemployed to um, having money, you know, money, and um, a place to live. And, you know, a phone bill paid, that kind of stuff, mm. which was, you know, what? <laughs> and then all of a sudden someone would ask you to be in a movie, and then you make a movie, and the movie does well, and then you have, you know, that's, that's and it was, it's a fantastic job because it's like a school teacher's job. You have the, you have all the holidays off, you have mm. big breaks at Christmas and Easter, you have, 
you do three weeks a month, so you get a whole week off every month. Right. And um, and the summer. And you get the summer off. Yeah. So you can do a movie in the summer, or, you know, vacation, go around the world, do anything you want to do. You get a week off every month. Think about that. A week off every month. It's fantastic. And it was it was it was an unbelievable job. And and then of course you know. You know, all that all the sort of fame thing comes along with it, and that's hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that's a different thing, but it, it changed a lot of things. And you know, the show back then was so cutting edge and and brand new, and people changed their habits. You know, to watch the television show. You know, they would wake, they would take a nap so they could stay up through the show. <laughs> people took naps to <laughs> see the show, or they'd all gather at someone's house. My yeah. mother wouldn't let us watch your show, and we had to go to my cousin's house <laughs> to watch it every week. You know, that kind of stuff. Crazy stories like that. <clears throat> so it was a big deal, and and you got to meet all kinds of great actors and actresses, and all the great music acts of the day. Right. And see, I mean, you know, we had the Rolling Stones on the show, and they were rehearsing in the SIR studios. You know, and uh, stones. the stones, yeah, yeah. and it's like you know, we'll g you guys want to come over? You know, we're, we're invited to come over and see the stones. So you go over to see the stones, and you walk in, someone hands you a Heineken, like, like someone's like, I'm drinking. Okay, right, here we go. The next thing you know, it's like seven hours later, and you, you know you're passing a bottle of Rebel Yell around <laughs> inside of a, a, a restroom. <coughs> you know, like what the hell? And they played like that great record. You know, it's a some girls record, and they mm -hmm. played. You know, you sit down and they play Beast of Burden, you know, which is like one of the greatest yeah. songs of all time, right? They play Beast of Burden and then they go, it's not quite right. And then they did it again. And they did it five more times. They just played live wow. Beast of Burden, like that far away, huh. five times in a row. Huh. And you're just like, this is, who am I? How the <laughs> hell did I get in here? This is ridiculous. So that kind of thing happened. <coughs> was it as wild as legend has it? There are all the what? SNL stories about the partying and the, the after parties and all that. Was it as crazy as they say it was? Well, the after parties had some intensity. Yeah. And, and the kind of release that you'd get after that, because the pressure was strong. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there was a lot of energy. It took a lot, it takes a, think about what kind of energy it takes to be at your highest level of performance at 11.30 at night yeah. on Saturday night until, until 1 o'clock in the morning. So you've got to get your clock all wound, rewound, and so the writing gets on that schedule, so then you're up all through the night, and then right. if you're out in the middle of the night, strange things happen. There's weirdness out there, <clears throat> and you get your body on this funny clock, but, you know, and I, I, I you know, the, you know, they talk about, oh, the, all the drugs and everything. Well, there were a lot of drugs in the world back then, and there are a lot of drugs in the world now, but we had a job to do. You had to get the job done. There, there was no one that was like too messed up to work, you know, except our guest hosts sometimes. <laughs> you know, they, they, would, they would get nervous and, you know, medicate themselves right. and like, oh, great. <laughs> You'd walk out there and go, oh, great. You know, between, just before the show, they, yeah. someone would, and you go, oh, perfect. <laughs> now we got to deal with this guy for the next 90 minutes. <laughs> you rolled out of SNL into one of the most incredible movie runs of <clears throat> Meatballs, Caddyshack, Stripes, going into Ghostbusters a couple of years after that. Tootsie. Tootsie, of course, Tootsie. I mean, you were hitting home run after mm -hmm. home run after home run. There are no weak links in that chain. Mm -hmm. What did that do to your life, especially once Ghostbusters became this international phenomenon? Well, it was fun. I mean, being a Ghostbuster is a great job. It's just a great job. We, we own the city. It was like, we could you, in that uniform with that car, you could do anything. <laughs> People actually believed we were some sort of special unit. I mean, really, I'm not kidding. There were people who thought, geez, these guys are pretty official. <laughs> you know, we, I mean, you walk in, we were walking to stores on Fifth Avenue with all, the, all the, the, the guns and everything, and people like, everything all right in here? You know, we're just checking things out and, you know, picking things up and saying, we better take a look at this. We'll, take this. we'll get this back to you. And we just walk out with things. You know, we bring it back like an hour later. And like, what the fuck? But it was, it was a great, um, there was a great run of movies. I had some great luck. I made some, you know, you know, I had great people helping me. I got, uh, you know, Harold Ramis, you know, on Meatballs and Stripes, and you know, John Candy, mm -hmm. and Ivan Reitman directed a couple of those movies. And 
used to give him a really hard time, but he basically, you know, he kept getting better at the movies, and we kept getting better. And Aykroyd, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, the Ghostbusters, that was mm -hmm. his, you know. He created that thing, and I mean, I remember he sent me like 17 pages, and I said, we're in. I, I said, this is great, we're, we're in. We had a caterer in about 20 minutes. <laughs> that movie was banked. <laughs> And he said, where, he was really nice to me, too. He, he said, where should we take it? And I said, well, I don't know. I'm trying to get this movie, The Razor's Edge, made over at Columbia, and they won't do it. And he said, tell them they can have this one. Mm. So the Razor's Edge was the, we had a caterer in 30 wow. minutes. <laughs> yeah. So that was, that was nice. But that was a great run of movies. And I've, I'm really, I like my movies. Uh, I've, I've been very, you know, lucky with movies. And it's, it's, it's saying no is the key thing. You've mm. got to say no. To certain movies, there's some movies. Even though you know it's going to be a successful movie, you, you know, you you you, just, you can let someone else take it. But I've had good luck with movies. I'm really proud of my movies. Well, you I like them. You've said no for a while, and then people view Groundhog Day as kind of like a comeback in some way for you. Did it feel that way to you, or no? You know, I, I never felt like comeback. There's a funny thing. We're doing this music show now with yeah. these guys, and somehow I never bother to write like everyone has their biography in the thing and I read mine and God it was the word they used was so after a dull period oh, or, it no. was like it was a crazy thing it was like and I go to like my guys go did you write this you know no we didn't I don't know it was like a dull listless lifeless <laughs> careers the, it was like what I never I mean I, I never thought of anything as like a comeback it's like you know, but I always I felt like I was always making fine choices. I mean, sometimes life occurs, you know, and you do yeah. things like, you know, have some children yeah. and do things. You don't always have to go to work. Um, but Lost in Translation was definitely something different for you, dramatically. Yeah, that was different, and that was a, that was a, you know, is that, that sort of represented a change of, of, of life, you know, in a way, you know, all of a sudden I was like a, like a like, you know, I was no longer an ingenue, you know. It's right. Like, okay, now you're this guy. You know that's what that was, and and it that and that was a different kind of thing. So, it, but it was the same process of working. You know, I was very fortunate that Sophia asked me to be in the movie. You know, I mean, a lot of people would kill to be in that movie. You know, are we surprised she asked you because it was an unconventional pick. They saw you one way. The public saw you one way, and not this way well, until they actually saw I you on the screen. Well, I knew I could do. I mean, I was thinking about that. I say I was thinking, you know, there's something romantic to do, and I was actually thinking about it. Not that I, I said there's something I could do that I haven't seen, you know, that is that a piece of life that just doesn't get shown, you know. And uh, she called up with this thing, and it was a very elegant, very spare script. And I went, cool. She said, well, what do you think? I said, well, well okay, I'll do it. And then they were all over there in Tokyo, th and they didn't think I was coming. You know, and I just <laughs> showed up. <laughs> but um, it's a it's a beautiful, you know, it's it's really she's a really good filmmaker. She gets better and better, and she's a delightful person too. So you think Hollywood looked at you differently after that? You were nominated for the Oscar. They saw you as a funny guy, and now you went, wait a minute. Probably, yeah. you know, but that's dull. You know, that's you know, there, it's like. You know, if you can bake a cake, do you think you could make a pie? Probably. <laughs> you know, you know, it's it's the same process of acting. You know, it's if you can do comedy, you can do drama. It's not always going the other way, but if you can do comedy, you can do drama. Because comedy's hard. Comedy's harder. So tell it's, me, you know, I can make you cry. I can make you cry in a second. Yeah. Right. Punch in the nose. But to make you <laughs> laugh, that's hard. You know, that's hard to do. That's it's not true. so easy. So that's a skill set you gotta you have to have great teachers and that ladies and gentlemen is the great bill murray my thanks to bill for spending so much time sitting down with us doesn't do a ton of interviews i'm so glad he strolled into the today show green room and requested one with me that's one i will always grant for more of our sunday sit downs be sure to click subscribe and don't forget to check out sunday today every sunday on nbc i'm willie geist thanks again for listening we'll see you back here next week